Hello, you guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Crime with Kylie podcast. We're going to be talking about a very fascinating case. Back in 1998, a woman was ruled as having gone overboard on the Rhapsody of the Seas cruise ship. But this ruling came months after her disappearance, and there's no real evidence that she actually went overboard. The woman I'm talking about is 23-year-old Amy Lynn Bradley. Amy Lynn Bradley was born on May 12th of 1974 in Virginia. She was the first child born to her parents, Ron and Iva Bradley. Shortly after she was born, they welcomed a baby boy, her brother, Brad Bradley. And Amy was an exceptional child and young woman. She excelled in sp- she excelled in sports and loved spending time with her family. She was one of those very rare people who would prefer to spend time with her parents and brother over a group of friends. In 1994, she began college and got a degree in sports psychology. And right after she graduated college in 1998, she actually got a job in that very same industry. Also during that time, she got her first apartment that she was very excited about because she got to share it with her bulldog named Daisy. So in other words, Amy Lynn had a lot going for her in life. Now in March of 1998, her dad's boss actually gave his entire family tickets for a cruise. This cruise would leave from Puerto Rico and go all the way to Curacao. This was a seven day cruise that would be taking place on the Rhapsody of the Seas cruise ship, which is a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. And with most cruise ships, each country that they docked at, they would be allowed to get off of the ship, hang out for the day before returning to the ship. Now the cabin setup was this, Amy Lynn and her brother Brad would be sharing a cabin and her parents would be sharing a cabin right next to theirs. So if they were standing on the balconies of each other's cabins, they could see each other. Keep that in mind for later. Now they boarded the cruise on March 21st of 1998. And as with most cruise ships, everyone who was on board was able to go and get their picture taken. Now this photographer was hired by the Royal Caribbean, but was an independent contractor. And a good comparison with these photos is like, if you go to Disneyland, you ride Splash Mountain, they take your picture, right as you're about to go down that drop, and then afterwards, if you like your picture or if you think it's really funny, you can pay for it. With this cruise and the pictures taken on this cruise, the only difference is that you would wait till the very last day of the cruise before you could see your photo. And all of these photos would just be lined up on one wall of the cruise ship so all the passengers could kind of have fun walking along this wall looking for their photo. So Amy had a photo taken of her and as did every one of her other family members. Also keep that in mind because it will come into play later on in this episode. So if you guys haven't noticed already, Amy Lynn Bradley was an exceptionally beautiful young woman and she caught the attention of many people who worked on that cruise ship, waiters included. So it was almost from the moment that Amy Lynn Bradley got on the cruise ship that she started getting kind of, you know, hit on. She was eating a meal with her parents and her brother and the waiter really wanted her to come with him to Aruba when the boat docked in Aruba. And the place in particular that he wanted to take her to was called Carlos and Charlie's. Now, when I first read that, I thought, gosh, that sounds very familiar. Where have I heard that before? And I have not gone to Aruba or anywhere near Aruba, so why would that sound familiar? Well, that is the last place that 18-year-old Natalie Holloway in 2005 was seen alive. And this is a very common case in the media that was just sort of solved. Natalie Holloway, a United States citizen, went to Aruba in 2005 for her senior class trip and she never returned. And the last place that she was seen with some very creepy, strange men was Carlos and Charlie's, which is a bar and grill in Aruba. Now, of course, Natalie's case occurred seven years after Amy Lynn Bradley's case, but I thought the connection was a bit strange. And the reason for that, which I'll elaborate on a little bit now, is because of human trafficking. And that is kind of the main theory in this case, the Amy Lynn Bradley case, as well as many cases of people who've gone missing on cruise ships. And sometimes in these cases, traffickers on certain islands or certain countries have connections with particular cruise ship workers and they're kind of in on it together. Now, obviously, I don't know what monetary benefits, if any, are split between them, but that is sometimes the case. So with that Carlos and Charlie's connection, I was wondering if any other crime has come out of there aside from Natalie Holloway and almost potentially Amy Lynn Bradley. Now, another potential connection I found to Carlos and Charlie's bar and grill, which is now Senor Frogs, I believe that that is what they reopened with because they got a lot of bad publicity from the Natalie Holloway case. But anyways, 
In 2011, there was another woman named Robin Gardner. She was from the state of Maryland in the United States, so once again, another US woman who traveled abroad. And Carlos and Charlie's wasn't exactly the last place that she was seen, but she was expected to be in that area before she went missing and is now presumed dead. So I don't know if that is a hot spot of some kind for trafficking or something darker, but that is kind of what I'm theorizing. Anyways, back to Amy Lynn Bradley. So Amy Lynn was getting hit on by quite a few of the cruise workers and she told her dad that she would not be going to Aruba with that one waiter because all of the people who were hitting on her, especially that waiter, really creeped her out. So there's that. Then let's flash forward to two days into the cruise on March 23rd of 1998. So the Royal Caribbean hired a like independent contractor band called the Blue Orchids. And this included three men. And they were playing at this party because you know how there's like clubs on ships. This one was the Mardi Gras club. And Amy and her brother Brad had gone out to the bar and they had gone out to party. So the two of them were out and then Amy was approached by this one man, the bass player of the Blue Orchids, who is referred to as Yellow. But his real name is Alistair Douglas. Now Alistair is thought to have been the last person to see Amy Lynn Bradley alive. And as you can see from the photo was caught that night he was very close to her but we do not know exactly what they were talking about and later on that night when her and her brother returned to their cabin which was around 3 55 a.m and then 4 o'clock a.m because that's when their key cards were used to get into the cabin she told her brother that yellow really freaked her out and also keep in mind amy lynn bradley was able to communicate this to her brother and she was able to walk back to her cabin by herself so it doesn't seem like she was that intoxicated. Also, although she was buying drinks at the bar, there's really no record of how many that she bought. Now, about an hour and a half later at 5.30 a.m., Amy's dad, Ron, was up. And remember how I told you guys that they had cabins right next to each other? So Ron went out to his balcony and he saw Amy Lynn sleeping in a chair on her balcony. And this was something that she had been doing since the beginning of the cruise because the cruise actually made her very uneasy. Although she was an excellent swimmer and a trained lifeguard, she was really scared of the open seas. And she also had some seasickness, which was kind of alleviated by sleeping outside. So her sleeping in the chair was completely normal, and that is why her dad was able to check on her because he was the room right next door. Another important thing to mention is that at this point, the boat is docked in Carousel. So it's not quite at the port yet, but it is not in motion and it is extremely close to the beach. So even hypothetically, if someone fell overboard, the waters were very warm, first of all, because it's a tropical area. And then secondly, it was extremely shallow waters and very close to the beach. So someone could easily swim. So 30 minutes later, her dad, Ron, goes and checks on her again, but he notices that Amy Lynn is not on the balcony anymore. But everything else looks fine. And it seems as though she actually went inside because the sliding glass door was closed, which previously it had been open. So it seems as though Amy Lynn Bradley went back inside of her cabin and then potentially left. Her dad went around the ship to the public areas and searched for her, but he could not find her. Now, the reason he immediately started searching was because his daughter, Amy Lynn, was not a morning person. It was not like her to just, you know, get up and start the day. And this was around 6 o'clock a.m. Then 30 minutes later after that, Ron went and woke his wife, Iva, as well as Brad, and said that he could not find Amy. So at this point, Amy is missing and the family goes and they tell the cruise line and they're begging them to just make an announcement and say, Amy Lynn Bradley is missing. This is what she looks like. Please help us find her. But the cruise line say that it's too early. And then her dad makes the request to not let anyone off of the ship in Carousel because there's like 2000 plus people on this boat and Amy could easily get smuggled off of the boat, especially if something happened to her, like she was roofied or who knows what. The cruise line, once again, does not take them seriously and lets everyone off of the boat around 8 o'clock a.m. It was only after letting every single person off of the boat that the cruise line finally made an announcement, but this announcement was not urgent. This was just saying, Amy Lynn Bradley, if you are currently on the boat, please come meet us in the main area. That was it. Nothing urgent, nothing like, oh, she's missing, nada. So the closest thing the family actually had to help was an eyewitness, and this woman was another passenger on the ship, and she claimed to see Amy Lynn Bradley in the elevator, and she was with Yellow, the man Alistair Douglas from the Blue Orchids band. And all she had with her was her cigarettes and her lighter, which actually tracked because those were the only two missing items from her cabin. 
But the woman said that she saw Alistair take her somewhere and then he came back a few minutes later by himself. And that was the last time that Amy Lynn Bradley was seen. A very strange thing that happened that morning is that around 6.30 a.m. Alistair Douglas or Yellow actually found Amy Lynn Bradley's family and said, I'm sorry for what happened to Amy. But at that point, they weren't even worried if something happened to her. They were just trying to find her on the ship and see what happened. Whether he had any of his fellow bandmates help smuggle her off of the ship, that kind of remains unknown. So for Alistair Douglas to come up to them seemed very preemptive. Now, another thing I was able to find on Alistair Douglas is that he has a daughter. And this daughter posted something to an Amy Lynn Bradley Facebook group. And this was saying that she thought more like she knew that her dad knew something about Amy Lynn Bradley because she claimed that her dad had Amy Lynn Bradley's photos with him in his possession. And then also her mom and dad would often fight over Amy Lynn Bradley. And usually with these cases, I do have to say that it's like the most obvious person is oftentimes the answer. So in this case, Alistair Douglas, the last person to ever see her alive, who was really freaking her out, kind of adds up. During this time, Amy Lynn Bradley's family was forced to stay on the ship and go back to the United States without their daughter. And then in 1999, just one year later, is when the sightings of Amy Lynn Bradley began. So you can't tell in any of these photos that I've found of Amy Lynn Bradley, but she has some very distinctive tattoos. She has a Tasmanian devil spinning a basketball on her shoulder. She has like a gecko around her navel and then a few Chinese characters. So not a lot of people have that combination of tattoos, let alone one of those tattoos. So for someone to have claimed to have seen her, I feel like is a pretty credible eyewitness sighting. So apparently in 1999, a person saw Amy Lynn Bradley walking along the beach in Carousel with two men. She was accompanied by two men and she kind of looked scared. And that was the first eyewitness sighting. Now, and another important thing to note is that Amy Lynn's disappearance was not widely broadcasted. Many, many passengers who are, many passengers who were on that ship didn't know that she even went missing because the cruise ship didn't announce it. And then later on, the cruise ship just announced that she must have gone overboard and it was that simple. So no one in Carousel or in general was really looking for Amy Lynn Bradley. And at that time, there were also no financial incentives. Then a few months later, also 1999, a US soldier claimed to have seen Amy Lynn Bradley in a brothel. He claimed that she came up to him, told him that her real name was Amy because someone was forcing her to use the name Jazz or Jazz. She also said that she lived in Virginia, was being held against her will, and that she missed her bulldog Daisy. All of those facts line up with the case. However, he did not come out with this information until after he was no longer working for the US military with fear that it would kind of like mess with his job, I think. Now the last confirmed sighting I believe was in 2005 and this was at a hardware store and she was accompanied by three men. And it was at this hardware store that the woman allegedly asked for help and also said that she was being held against her will. My husband and I went on a cruise. The ship docked in Barbados at Bridgetown and we decided to go downtown and do some shopping. While using a department store ladies room, Judy finds herself trapped in a frightening situation. I went into the stall. As soon as I got into the stall and sat down, I heard somebody coming into the restroom and I heard men's voices. My automatic response was to hide because I was afraid they came in to rob me or, you know, rape me or something. I didn't know what was going on. Gripped with fear, Judy listens as one of the men makes a threatening statement to someone. He must have said five or six times, the deal's at 11 o'clock and you better be ready to go. He goes, and I'm warning you, you better cooperate. This is my deal and you better not mess it up. And he just kept saying this. You had to be just trembling. I was, fear. I was petrified. I was practically holding my breath because I'm thinking I'm witnessing something that I shouldn't be witnessing. Then, as quickly as they enter the restroom, the men leave. But Judy Maurer is still not alone. Cowering by the sink is a young woman who appears to be in her early 30s. She looked like she's about ready to cry. So I tried to talk to her because I could see that she was just really distraught. So I said, well, where are you from? And she talked so softly that I could barely hear her. But at the time I thought she said Virginia. What the woman told Judy next was unmistakable. 
So then I says, well, what's your name? And then real softly, she says, Amy. And what I did felt, you do when she said her name was Amy? Well, I said, um, oh, my daughter's name is Amy. She got the most horrid look on her face. Her mouth flew open and she did a pivot towards me and then starts walking towards me and getting in my space like, like this. And she did that three times like she was trying to get me to be quiet. That instant, the men's voices reappeared outside the door. I heard a pounding on the door real loud and I could hear a man making noises. Additionally, in 2005, these photographs surfaced. And these photos were discovered by a database that helps in tracking people who were forced into sexual slavery. And as you can probably tell, these photos very closely resemble Amy Lynn Bradley. And the other clue is that this woman was identified as Jass, which is the same name that was provided to like the US um, soldier. Now, I personally believe that these photos are of Amy Lynn Bradley and so does her family. And many people have analyzed the smallest details from her eyes to her crow's feet to the wrinkles to every single thing. And it just looks like a older, more distraught, disheveled version of Amy as though Amy was forced into sexual slavery against her will. And the other thing about Carousel, the location, is that at least by US rankings, it is rated one of the lowest tiers for human trafficking. So it has a high ranking for people who are forced into human trafficking. And then it also ranks high on the fact that it's not really reported on there. So they're not trying to actively stop what's going on. And now the last thing I want to say that makes me believe that she was forced into trafficking is the photo. So remember how at the beginning of this case, I mentioned how at the very beginning of the cruise, she took a photo and then seven days later, she could go and buy the photo and it would be on the wall. Well, her family went to go look for her photo on the last day of the cruise and everyone else's photo was there, including all of the rest of her family's, except for Amy Lynn Bradley's. And of course, the family remembers that she got her photo taken. And then even the photographer said that he was willing to bet his job on the fact that he took a picture of Amy Lynn Bradley. Her photo was not there. So who took it? Now, I want to say that this is a very common tactic for people, especially women, who were victimized on cruise ships or who were potentially trafficked or who were trafficked. If you go to the International Cruise Victims website, there's a story about a young woman who is referred to as Lizzie, and she was kind of a young teenager, very pretty. Her mom is the one who wrote this story, so Lizzie's not her real name. Anyways, her daughter ended up being drugged in a teen center by four other boys, like older boys, maybe in their 20s. And her daughter also had a lot of very strange interactions with cruise ship workers. Her daughter was found a few hours later, thankfully, but she was found shoved in a cubby in the bottom of the ship. And it was confirmed that her daughter had been roofied. Then after that, those boys who saw her were like, well, what are you still doing here? You should be like low key, like you should be trafficked. So, and then they would call her horrific names like slut, whore, etc. Very derogatory, horrific names. Now I'm bringing her up because on the very last day of the cruise, when they went to go buy their photos, her daughter's photo, Lizzie's photo, was missing. And this seems to be a very common tactic, whether it's how the traffickers are able to identify the person who they're going for, or whether someone from the cruise line is taking them so that way it's easier to be like, what do you mean they were never there? I don't know, but I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this because this is personally a very interesting theory to me. It's happened more than once, more than twice. Now, sadly, Amy Lynn Bradley was declared legally dead in 2010. After that, there weren't really any more eyewitness sightings of her. And as I mentioned earlier, the cruise line declared that she must have just gone overboard or she must have taken her life, which... Her family believes neither of those theories and there's really nothing to suggest that she would have taken her own life. But nonetheless, the FBI is still offering, I believe, a $25,000 to $50,000 reward for any tips leading to answers on what happened to Amy Lynn Bradley. And the last thing before we end today's episode is I wanted to bring up Natalie Holloway once again. So Natalie Holloway, 18 years old, vanished in Aruba and now her killer and kidnapper has confessed. And I believe his name is Haran or Jaron Vandersloot. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but that's, that's essentially what, what happened. Natalie Holloway's mom, Beth Holloway, has been an activist, especially in cases where people went missing internationally, 
or on a cruise or in another country. And she actually worked very closely with Ron and Iva Bradley, Amy Lynn Bradley's parents. And she also thoroughly believes that their daughter was trafficked. And I'll play you guys a quick little clip of that before we sign off for the day. In 2005, I got the call telling me that my daughter, Natalie, had vanished. Every parent's worst nightmare became my reality. I asked the world to help me. I found myself in an unimaginable fight. My search for answers gave me a new mission in life. Bring the missing home and criminals to justice. Amy was born first and ran the show. Amy lettered in five sports in high school. Brad did the same thing. Was Amy a take charge sister? Focused and a fireball and... A lot like her mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always be there for you. I love you, little brother. Hey! <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining me in today's episode, and I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next week. Bye.